Dr. Ping Wang is a professor and chief of endocrinology here at UCI. He is also a very valued member of the Stem Cell Research Center. He has his office just down the, the hall from me downstairs. Um, and he's been, here, do you want to plug in while I'm chit-chatting? Sure. Um, he uh, has driven an enormous impact in terms of diabetes research and also clinical developments and treatments. And he's a part of our Alpha Stem Cell Clinic um, pipeline for clinical trials as we're shaping up over the next couple of years. I should mention maybe he also just came back uh, with me from a visit to the University of Maastricht um, where he and the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs, myself and the Chair of Molecular Biology and Biochemistry, who's also a member of the Stem Cell Research Center, Chris Hughes, went for a visit because we're actually kicking off a cooperative seed grant program that's international with their regenerative med, uh, medicine program, which is called Regenerative Medicine Crossing Borders, or RegMed XB. Um, and we had really a fantastic site visit there, and we're really excited to launch that aspect of our seed grant program, which is going to kick off focusing on organ and tissue engineering um, using stem cells uh, in next March. Okay, thank you. I'm the chief of endocrinology at UC Irvine, and also I'm the director of the UC Irvine uh, Diabetes Center. And uh, Diabetes Center has been working uh, closely uh, with the stem cell uh, program here, stem cell center, and uh, the two programs are really uh, complementary uh, to each other to advance uh, diabetes research. Um, talk about diabetes, I cannot help start by talking about how big the problem is. This is how big the problem is. The uh, diabetes uh, right now represent probably the single biggest health challenge for all over the world. Right now, we have about 387 million people who have diabetes worldwide. And this number is gonna increase by uh, two, another 200, 000, uh, 200 millions or so uh, by the year of 2035. So, all the countries are trying to figure out how can we better manage this problem. Okay. So this is how the medical research advance science and improve our health. In a sort of uh, a research university like UC Irvine, uh, we have some advantages. For example, we have cutting edge researchers and technologies uh, we have scientific information exchange freely. We have multidisciplinary collaboration. We have also funding through government, uh, philanthropy, and industry support. So all these things working together to produce the science that will allow us to move our health care forward. Okay. This is uh, a photo of one of the first uh, insulin preparation that was first prepared in University of uh, Toronto many, many years ago in 1923. And this is also the year that the, those two people who discovered insulin, Dr. Bentin and Dr. Best, they got Nobel Prize in uh, 1923. And this is one of the first bottles of insulin prepared uh, to be used for patients. The way you inject insulin in those days is you have to use this huge a uh, syringe and a big thick needle. The whole process would take uh, more than one hour and 30 minutes. First, you had to put it out, and then you have to boil it in uh, uh, boiling water for 30 minutes, and then afterwards, you clean with uh, alcohol, and then that is dry, because you cannot draw insulin into it until the syringe is dry. And after you draw the insulin, you inject, after you inject it, you use the tool, you clean up the uh, syringe, wash it, and then boil it again for another 30 minutes, and then you take it out, uh, rinse in alcohol, and let it air dry until you use it in the next time, okay? So a lot of advances in science we have already made. The diabetes care is very, very different from those days. The reason why? Because we have been doing research, we have been advancing the science and medical care. That's the reason why uh, our life expectancy is much longer than 1923, and diabetes is just a good example. Uh, at the Diabetes Center, uh, we have uh, raised some money, uh, some funds in the past. Uh, in the last few years, we have raised about 3.7 million of money. However, as a result of your support, we were able to leverage it and obtain over $20 million of extramural funding uh, to carry out our work. 
And the result of uh, the, the research is um, nothing short of spectacular. These are the research done by the uh, scientists at the Diabetes Center, published in top-ranked journals uh, throughout the world. And these are the kind of journals that generate significant impact in the field. Okay. Looking into the future uh, at our Diabetes Center in the clinical care, uh, we are looking forward to about 5% growth every year, which is the rate of growth we have been doing in the last five years. And the research-wise, uh, we want to solve diabetes and metab metabolic syndrome from uh, investment in talents and in technology. And we would like to manage health through artificial intelligence. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it with digital medicine and population health. This is uh, what typically taught in the medical school about type 1 diabetes. I'm going to first talk about type 1 diabetes. Okay. There are several stages in the development of type 1 diabetes. First of all, the individual who eventually came down with type 1 diabetes uh, usually carry some kind of genetic markers. Uh, if you don't have this specific genetic marker, generally speaking, you won't get type 1 diabetes. And then somehow the genetic background or genetic de defect, if you will, somehow interact with the, some of the environmental factors we have not yet identified that predispose these individuals to autoimmune destruction of pancreas. What does it mean? Meaning that your own immune system start to attack the insulin producing cells inside the pancreas and cause inflammation. And the result of the inflammation is going to destroy these insulin pro uh, producing cells even eventually. As the cell function started to decline, uh, the blood sugar will start to rise, and eventually this individual will be diagnosed as what we know as type 1 diabetes. For type 1 diabetes, that's how we taught uh, our medical student and medical resident uh, throughout the world. Most of those knowledge are actually gained from animal experiment. Because for type 1 diabetes patients, we usually don't open up their uh, 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 abdomen and look at the pancreas or do a biopsy on the pancreas and nobody will let you do that, right? Just take a look at the pancreas and see how it changed. But sometimes you have that kind of opportunity, right? Because uh, a type 1 diabetes patient might go into surgery for other diseases. And the result really surprised us. For example, this is an individual who have type 1 diabetes for several years and then need to have their pancreas removed. So when uh, the scientists look at his pancreas, they were surprised. Why they are surprised? Because you can see in this region, there is a complete loss of insulin producing cell, complete loss of islet cells. But there are another region inside the pancreas, the islet cell is still preserved. Meaning that what we think is, uh, we used to think the islet cell are completely destroyed in type 1 diabetes may not be totally true. And this is just one piece of the evidence that islet cells were not completely destroyed in type 1 diabetes. This is important because we used to think that we have to replace all the insulin producing cells in order to make the uh, treatment work. But right now there are a lot of effort is being spent on how to revitalize these remaining surviving islet cells in a human. Okay. This also illustrates one of the challenges in th uh, type 1 diabetes research, which is what we know in the mice and rats may not be applicable to human. Okay. Do we know that for sure? Well, we are going to be talking about it. So knowing how type 1 diabetes occur, it's immune, 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 and immune system. This is the cause of type 1 diabetes. The loss of islet cells is actually not the cause of type 1 diabetes. It's the immune system uh, turn against your own insulin producing cells and destroying it. So if we want to get to the root of the problem, we have to somehow uh, uh, harness uh, this autoimmune system. One way of treating type 1 diabetes is to use islet cell transplantation you can put in new islet cells from another individuals or using islet cells growing out of stem cells 
and then put it back to the patient to replace the damaged eyelids. And this way will allow that individual to start to produce insulin again and um, potentially provide a cure for diabetes. Um, this technology has been developing since the uh, uh, 1990s. But soon we find out there are problems, actually a lot of problems associated with eyelid cell transplantation. For example, the eyelid cell you put in may not live forever, and uh, the immune system might come back and destroy the eyelid cells. So we still have some way to go in this technology. Like this is one of the options. And that option is the latest development in engineering. Okay. This is called artificial pancreas, which is composed of three different components. One is the insulin pump, which automatically delivers insulin. Another component is a device called continuous glucose sensor. With a continuous glucose sensor, the glucose level is being constantly monitored. And then this message was then sent to a uh, kind of control algorithm with engineering, with a microchip control, and with uh, calling the insulin pump and then deliver the right amount of insulin uh, when the patient need it at the minute to minute basis. This provide another means of controlling diabetes or uh, a more uh, kind of free uh, style of life uh, without the burden having to inject insulin or having to uh, manage your own insulin dose. Now, we talk about immune system is very important in the occurrence of type 1 diabetes. And these are the reason why eyelid cells got destroyed. In the immune system, we have something called T cell system. And T cell is the one that executes the kill on the eyelid cell. This is the eyelid cell. There is another very important com uh, component called T regulatory cells. This is the kind of cell kind of coordinate or the attack on, on the uh, uh, on the eyelid cells. Another one is called B cell. This is sort of like a cell. They can fire up antibodies. Antibody is like a missile. B cell can be staying somewhere else in the body, and then they make antibody. Antibody will then tra travel through the bloodstream to attack uh, the uh, eyelid cells. So with a combination of things, uh, the eyelid cells can be destroyed in the case of type 1 diabetes. Now, the scientists have uh, identified dozens of opportunities over the years. And these are the things that we think play an important role in regulating this process. So if we know the mechanism, how this ha happened, then we can solve it, right? Well, in theory, yes. So all these dozens of uh, targets that have been highlighted on these slides has already been tested in laboratory animals in the mice and prove that actually work. When you block these pathways uh, in uh, animal models of type 1 diabetes, uh, they work beautifully. But every single one of them fail in clinical trial. Okay? Human immune system is not mice immune system. Okay? This is the hard lesson we have learned. We spend a lot of time and money collectively just try to figure this thing out. So any future study on the human of, uh, with an attempt to cure type 1 diabetes through immune modulation, we would have to take account the unique future of human immune system. As I say, uh, eyelid cells uh, can be transplanted, but we also know from clinical trials, uh, including some of the work done here by, uh, done by uh, Dr. Lakey when he was in Canada, uh, we know that it doesn't last forever, and there could be many reasons. It could be insufficient eyelid cell mass, uh, and the uh, eyelid cell is fail, uh, fail, uh, fail to engraft, uh, and, and so they are not happy in the environment they were on. And there could be additional things, such as insulin resistance occur among the patients, or it could be the rejection, body's immune system doesn't like a foreign body, and they would reject the cells. Uh, or disease occurrence, meaning that the type 1 diabetes wake up, the autoimmune system wake up, they notice there are eyelid cells, and these are the target they are supposed to attack. So when the new cell, healthy cells start coming, they start to attack on it. Okay. And then this is another thing that is 
toxicity of anti-rejection uh, drugs. I mean, there could be toxicity on liver, on the kidney, and even uh, skin cancer. Uh, so these are the things uh, we have to uh, confront uh, for the future in future islet cell transplantation uh, research. Um, because of the toxicity of the anti-rejection drugs, right now FDA is limiting islet cell transplantation to a very small group of type 1 diabetes. These are the individuals who have very brittle control and who have hypoglycemia unawareness, meaning that they don't know their blood sugar is low, and because they don't know their blood sugar is low, and when their blood sugar is low, what they do? They pass out. So it can be life-threatening situation, and these will be the candidate for islet cell transplantation. Okay. The future of insulin therapy is really on what's so-called artificial pancreas. Artificial pancreas, as I explained to you, uh, is use a combination of uh, a glucose sensor, insulin pump, and then a computerized algorithm to control the delivery of insulin. And from clinical trials, we know that this device actually achieved very good control. This, in the air, this, is, uh, the, this panel represents the blood sugar levels in the patients, in the type 1 diabetes patient. The red zone represents the traditional way of treating patients with insulin shots. And when the patient got put on this uh, artificial pancreas, look at this, all the blood sugar stay in the uh, blue zone mostly are on target. And there was no uh, hypoglycemia. So the result is nothing short of amazing, okay? Uh, this year, two artificial pancreas um, has come onto the market. They are not fully automated yet, but they are semi-automatic, okay? And uh, one is made by uh, Medtronic, the other one is made by T-Slim. Uh, they are both on the market and has uh, received pretty good reviews uh, from the, those patients who have used it. Now, let's uh, stop a second and talk about type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is somewhat different. Type 2 diabetes is caused by insulin resistance because the body resists to insulin and insulin doesn't work well. And then uh, there is also a component of uh, a beta cell failure, meaning the pancreas cannot produce enough insulin to control adequate glucose level. And with a combination of the two, a uh, patient can get type 2 diabetes. And obesity uh, and lifestyle and diet, they are all important factors. And then genetic disposition is also another big factor. So again, you say, well, since we know the cause of it, now we can cure it, right? Uh, yeah, maybe. But this is how it turned out. Okay. When Scientists do genome-wide scanning, try to figure out where are the genetic defects for type 2 diabetes. They have identified more than 400 genetic defects associated with type 2 diabetes. Okay. And uh, so it's very complex and it's very diverse and make the disease uh, more difficult to cure. This is the UCI diabetes research teams. We have uh, many uh, scientists and uh, researchers and physicians uh, involved in this effort. Um, we have Dr. Greenfield and uh, Dr. Kaplan. Dr. Greenfield is actually sitting in the back. Dr. Greenfield is a world guru in uh, diabetes policy. And uh, he is a uh, member of uh, 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 National Academy of uh, Medicine. Okay, it's there. Maybe you want to wave at everybody. It's a prestigious uh, position. He is a pioneer in this field. And he's right here at the UCI. And we have, uh, we have different teams of people uh, working on cardiovascular complication, kidney problems, and Dr. Bogie Anderson's uh, lab, my lab, and Dr. Donovan's lab, uh, we work on uh, the stem cell. And uh, then we have Dr. Cahalan's lab working on the immune problems for type 1 diabetes. And we have various teams work on various aspects of body that affect blood sugar control or the development of complication. I just want to highlight three. These are the three uh, group of uh, uh, three laboratory or three scientists uh, we just recently recruited to UCI. UCI was able to recruit these people. Dr. Uh, Parson, Mike Parsons, used to be associate director for a diabetes center at the Johns Hopkins. We were happy to uh, recruit him to UC Irvine. He's an expert on islet cell development. 
okay? And then we also have Dr. Meng Kang. We store her from uh, the City of Hope. He's, she's working on fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome. Uh, and more recently, just last month, we had Dr. Uh, Tim Kearns and Dr. Uh, Prozeski's group. Uh, we store them from uh, Case Western Reserve uh, University. And especially Dr. Kern, he is the world leading basic scientist for retinopathy eye complication research in diabetes. Okay, so we're happy to have him here to help us accomplish our goal. Now, I just want to touch a little bit things. We need to have a combination of tools and method and approach to try to manage diabetes. And I think one of the future exciting areas is what we call digital health. This could be the convergence of digital uh, revolution, molecular medicine technology, and next generation healthcare. Uh, we, t we talk about artificial intelligence, and uh, artificial intelligence uh, can do a lot of things for us. But in the future, when you go to walk into the future hospital or future clinic to get your medical care, the doctors is going to be equipped with a lot of different type of information on his fingertip. Okay, it will merge into the medical record electronically about your past medical record, about your health situation. And all this is going to be like a, a GPS for your doctors uh, pro provide better care for you. And here at UC Irvine, we are also uh, developing uh, such tools to help integrate uh, the genetic, help integrate your lifestyle, glucose control, and integrating into the um, uh, a me a medical record to provide uh, next generation uh, health care for our diabetes patients. Now, the last slide, this is my last slide. We wa I want to talk about the exciting new development here with the collaboration of Diabetes Center and Stem Cell Research Center. And I think this is very exciting because we are going to be launching a new clinical trial effort uh, in next year. As a matter of fact, one of these trials already launched uh, last month. We already have recruited the first patient into the study. Okay. So I'm going to start with the bottom first. First of all, just continue what I say about digital health uh, uh, intervention for type 2 diabetes patient by artificial intelligence. This is an automatic program to help you to improve your lifestyle and hence better health. And uh, this part of the study is already launched. And then uh, we will be, next year, we will be uh, conducting a study looking at a specific genetic defect in particular type 1 diabetes patients. And then we will try to modify their genetic response. The reason is this uh, genetic defect is associated with a specific kind of uh, biochemical changes that we feel we can modify and therefore we can help them to preserve their beta cell function. Okay. And then there will be two islet cell transportation trial. This one is going to be kicked off uh, in a month or so. It's a T cell depression to improve the outcome of islet cell, to get rid of the uh, immune system that can interfere with islet cell function and to see if we can achieve better outcome on our islet cell. This one is already FDA approved. Everything is, is going through the process, so we'll be recruiting the patient really soon. The second one is gastrin therapy to improve the outcome of islet cell transportation. This gastrin is a, a, a uh, growth factor that we think will be able to improve the outcome of islet cell uh, survival. Uh, among type 1 diabetes patients. So this will be going. So you are asking me, while well, we are just talking about all the islet cells uh, trial or fail, well, we still continue to do it. Because this still provide hope. And secondly, uh, the, uh, we will be able to learn a lot of the uh, information about how immune system interact in diabetes. And then we have a very exciting trial, which is now going through the FDA right now. This is represent a medicine chemo stem cell derived extracellular vesicles. There are two patients receive this therapy uh, in Europe. Newly diagnosed type 1 and both regain 80% of the insulin secreting capacity. And we are going to be bringing that opportunity here to UC Irvine. Thank you. 
So I'm going to ask everyone to hold questions, um, if you don't mind, for just the next uh, 20 minutes or so, and um, introduce Dr. Jonathan Lakey. You've heard, well, I talked about the idea of a, uh, a pipeline of injury. Can you, sorry, yep, can you that. plug that in there? Um, about the uh, pipeline of, of research from basic science on into the clinical side, and that that's very important to regenerative medicine and stem cell biology. So I'll get it in a second. Um, so um, you've heard about the clinical side of that from Dr. Wang, and now I'd like to invite one of our translational researchers, Dr. John Lakey, to talk to you really about that process, the discovery process, and then moving on through into clinical trials with which he has experience of both. And so he is Professor of Medicine, um, Professor of Medicine, although a PhD, surgery, sorry, um, at the UCI School of Medicine, I'll get my words right in a second, along with the um, School of Engineering, where you have a joint appointment. Um, and we're very pleased to have him in the Stem Cell Center also. His focus is on diabetes and looking for mechanisms of regenerative repair. And I will get your slide. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to you tonight some of the research I've been working on uh, at UCI over the past uh, 10 years. So Dr. Wang went through this, the staggering costs and, and, and implications of diabetes in the United States. Uh, 30 million individuals have a, either type 1 or type 2 diabetes, and close to $325 billion is spent on treating diabetes and diabetes-related complications each and every year. Each day, close to 4,000 individuals are diagnosed with diabetes. 200 of those will undergo amputation. 140 of those will start dialysis. And close to 1,800 of those will undergo changes in their eye, leading to retinopathy. So it's truly an epidemic that we need to understand and solve. So Dr. Wang introduced the concept of islet cell transplantation. And I've been involved in this field for probably about 20 years now, first as a student, then as a, a junior faculty at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. And at that program, we were able to collect cadaveric organs. So people that had died in car accidents or had cerebral bleeds, we would collect the pancreas, just like the kidney transplants, liver transplants, and we'd bring it to the laboratory where we'd isolate these insulin-producing cells that he talked about, these islet cells. And we transplanted them into diabetic recipients. So the transplant was not a surgical procedure. It was done in the radiology suite. You'd go in through a small puncture, into the side after numbing agents, and you'd introduce a catheter or, an, or tube into the liver, and you can see, I'll try Brian's new pointer, you can see this, this tube going in through the branch of the liver. We would draw the islets up into a syringe, and we would inject them into the liver. And in the liver, these insulin-producing cells would start to make insulin. So we would stop insulin in the radiology suite. And over time, we were able to monitor the graft function of these transplanted islet cells. So we published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine almost 18 years ago, and it described for the first time the procedure where we would be able to use cell therapy to treat patients with type, brittle type 1 diabetes. We developed ways to improve the islet isolation. We also developed ways to try and reduce some of the toxic effects of the immunosuppressants, these anti-rejection drugs. So we developed a steroid-free immunosuppression cocktail that allowed these transplanted cells to function in our patients. So every, the diabetics that are monitoring, this slide represents a month-long recording, and each dot represents a blood glucose reading. Over a month-long period, you can see there's hundreds of samples you can see what we'd like to see is the blood samples between the red and the blue line. Unfortunately, there's a lot in the high, and there's some of these low hypoglycemic readings, and those are the dangerous ones. People are testing throughout the entire 24-hour period. After an islet cell transplantation, this is the type of control that we can see post-transplant. Patients are following within that line for the most part, and most importantly, we're seeing an absence of those hypoglycemic events. And that's really critical because that was one of the major points of patients joining the clinical trial. We also look at some of the other blood markers following islet cell transplantation, and one of them is called hemoglobin A1C. It's a marker of your blood sugar control over the past three months. 
Pre-transplant, these patients had elevated hemoglobin A1Cs. And within about three months, these patients' hemoglobin A1Cs fell to within near normal range and stayed, for, stayed with that for the number of months post-transplant. After the announcement of this initial trial, the Immune Tolerance Network and the NIH funded a trial at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. I said that right, a NIH-funded trial in Canada to replicate the Edmonton Protocol. And as a result, these nine centers around the world were taught the protocol and we were able to publish again another paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that, out, that detailed the outcome of that trial. And at that time, President Clinton hailed the Edmonton Protocol as a major advancement in the treatment of diabetes. Now since that time, there have now been over 65 institutions and over 2,200 patients that have received islet cell transplantation using this protocol or a variation of this protocol. So where do we stand today? Human islet transplantation is available today but is limited by the lack of organ donors, the lack of consistent and reliable organs that we can isolate these insulin producing cells from. The pancreas is varying quality and, and, and qual uh, quality we also have to place, place patients on chronic, lifelong immunosuppression, and we don't want to do that. Now, there was a comment made about uh, insulin sensors. If you compared islet transplantation to insulin sensors, islet cell transplants have their own built-in glucose sensor. They make their own insulin, and they keep blood sugar controls perfectly normal. You don't need to recharge these systems, and they release the insulin perfectly because this is the natural physiological way to deliver insulin therapy. So, this handful of pills, unfortunately, represent the daily, uh, the daily drug therapy that patients have to take post-transplant. So that's not practical or feasible. So we have to come up with an alternative system. So to, to come up with an unlimited source of insulin producing cells, we're looking at xenogeneic tissue, which is using pig, Pig insulin, pig insulin and human insulin differ by one amino acid. And pig insulin was used for many years before the discovery of recombinant technology. We're also in a stem cell building, so we're working on ways to differentiate stem cells into insulin producing cells. So to eliminate the lifelong immunosuppression, part of our work is developing biomaterials. Materials that we can place these cells, the islets or the stem cells, into devices that we can protect them from the body so that, it, so that patients don't need to take lifelong anti-rejection drugs. So I saw this slide. I think Eileen, you had the same slide, so I probably got it from you. So let's talk a little bit about stem cells. And I think Eileen was able to give you guys a brief description of what a stem cell is and the potential of a stem cell. It can become any cell in the body. And your example of the tree, we're going down a, specific, a very specific path for our endocrine system for the islet cells. So basic characteristics of stem cells, they have to be pluripotent, which means that they can differentiate into any specific type of cell. There's two broad types, embryonic and adult derived. And adult derived may come from bone marrow, fat, or IPS cells, fibroblasts that you can take and differentiate. And these cells continue to express markers. That's how we identify them in the lab. And what we're doing is we've developed ways to push these cells through trial and error down a very specific pathway so that they become insulin producing cells. So in the normal pancreas development, it takes about 12 to 13 weeks to go from the pluripotent stem cell to this islet cell. And the islet cell has insulin, glucagon, and other hormones within that structure. So what we've been able to do is work and, and there's protocols now out there, it takes about three weeks from the time we start to the time we have this insulin producing cell that we can then transplant in animal models and put into biomaterials. So we've had a, a long-standing collaboration with Novo Nordisk, the largest insulin manufacturer in the world based in Copenhagen, where we've developed protocols with them to differentiate these islets, these stem cells into insulin producing cells we characterize them, and then we ship them via overnight FedEx Express from Copenhagen to UC Irvine, where we're putting them into animal models of diabetes. 
So again, we're taking that protocol and going about a three-week differentiation, and we now at the end have specific markers for insulin, specific markers for glucagon in red, and another hormone in the, in the islet, somatostatin. And so what we're able to do is generate these structures of islets to differentiated from stem cells. So this is an example of some of our differentiated stem cells. They look like islets that we've isolated in the past. They have these round multicellular clusters. The green is insulin, the red is glucagon, and the blue is just the nucleus. So we're able to make these cells, and now the next step is to transplant them. And so one of the models that we use are these little mice. They're called athymic nude mice. They're nude mice because they have no hair. And the thing that we like about them is they have no immune response. So we can transplant these cells without having to deal with immunity. We can put the cells in either as individual cells. And we, this is the kidney capsule of these mice, about the size of a bean. So we take these cells, we collect them, place them under the membrane in the kidney, and we can monitor these animals. We make them diabetic, and we can track their, their progress over time. So when you're doing good experiments, you always have good controls. So the first group of controls is non-transplanted non controls. Mice that we just keep, monitor their blood sugar throughout the follow-up period. The next group is animals that we make diabetic. So we have a drug that's very specific, it destroys their native pancreas and their insulin-producing cells. These animals become hyperglycemic, high blood glucose, and they stay hyperglycemic throughout the follow-up. We then did a series of transplants. The animals became hyperglycemic after making them diabetic. They came down for a period of time, but unfortunately, we lost the graft failure. We lost that graft. So we then went back, increased the dose, and were able to for the first time, we're able to show normal glycemic, and we've kept these animals for months and months and months, and then we can go in, take out the kidney, and the animal becomes hyperglycemic. So we thought we were off to the races, let's, let's uh, start the clinical trial and go from there. Unfortunately, when you're working with stem cells and trying to expand and differentiate these cells, it's inconsistent from one batch to the next batch. And so we had circumstances where we'd be receiving these cells and some would have higher proportions of glucagon cells and, and glucagon here, lower portions of insulin producing cells. So we've been working with the company to try and improve the consistency and reliability. But we have cells that we can now take and we're moving forward with that on several other projects. So stem cells for islet transplantation, there are several strategies are being explored. There's a lot of academic as well as industry uh, leading uh, studies, multiple sources. People have used human embryonic stem cells or adult derived stem cells from fat, blood, mesenchymal stem cells, even IPS cells. Groups either differentiate them in the incubator like we do or in the body. And I'll talk about Viacite at the end, which has done a clinical trial with pre-differentiated uh, stem cells. But what we feel very strongly about is that we need to protect these differentiated cells from the body and be able to retrieve them if necessary. Because these stem cells still have the capacity to de-differentiate or go back and maybe become a tumor cell. So we always want the ability to be able to retrieve them if necessary. So how are we gonna do that? We've been working in the biomaterial side of things on different membranes, semi-permeable membranes that allow nutrients to pass through but block antibodies and other immune markers. So these semi-permeable membranes will allow us to transplant without any anti-rejection drugs. This is just an example of one of the technologies we're working on. It's called microencapsulation. And here's an islet cell inside this membrane and it allows insulin and glucose to pass through, but blocks a lot of the immune markers. And again, individual islets per capsule. But there are other strategies. There are strategies called macro encapsulation, where larger devices, and this is an Israeli company that's developed a device about the size of a hockey puck, and it's placed underneath the skin, loaded with cells. We're doing some work uh, using 3D printers to make devices. And there's this device, which was the device used by, by Viasite in their initial clinical trial. 
So microencapsulation have these single membranes or double membranes around the islet cells. There's even people working on nanoencapsulation where they have a conformal coating around the cell of interest. Again, it could be a stem cell or it could be an islet cell. It doesn't really matter. So I'm part of an international collaboration where we're putting the pieces of the puzzle together. We've working with groups all over the world. Uh, our group is doing device, the design device, 3D printing. We have a group in Canada that's helping us with biomaterials, a group that we have a, a JDRF grant on the biomaterials side. We're working in China doing primate transplants of our, not only our, our stem cells, but also some of our biomaterials. Working in Australia on a genetically modified pig and primate transplants there, and a clinical trial in Argentina. So in terms of the clinical trial in Argentina, I've been working with this group for a couple of years at the Eva Perón Hospital in Buenos Aires. What they've done is they've developed a clinical protocol. They've transplanted 22 patients where they've taken microencapsulated islets and implanted them into the peritoneal cavity. No immunosuppression, and they're following up for at least two years. And so at six months, they went in to the abdomen. You can see these capsules adhering to the wall of the liver. What you look at in terms of the hemoglobin A1C is you see an improvement. And again, they looked at a couple different doses. And you're seeing the hemoglobin A1C improving and staying for out now almost three years post-transplant. In terms of insulin requirements, it varies based on the patient. But in, in, in general, they're seeing about a 30 to 50% decrease in their insulin requirements in this trial. And again, it's a start. We're working towards a, a, a project that allow us to get patients off insulin. Now, in terms of Viacite, they've, they've been working for several years, have had uh, huge awards from CIRM and JDRF to take a human differentiated stem cell product. It's partially differentiated. It's called PEC-1. They've developed it. They've expanded it, scaled it up, freeze it, and then have that prepared. So that it's a, not a fully differentiated cell, and they assume that these cells would differentiate in the device when transplanted. And so some of the pitfalls of their, of their study is that they're using a very high dose of cells, almost 80,000 uh, of these cells per kilogram body weight. It takes a 18 weeks to develop. They are able to show insulin. Again, insulin in this case is red. Glucagon is uh, no, insulin is blue, glucagon is red, somatostatin is, is green, and there's higher levels of somatostatin. But unfortunately, these cells continue to grow they, and expand, and so the devices start to pillow out. And so the cells in the middle, unfortunately, are dying. And that's one of the strategies that they have to overcome, is to develop a different biomaterial that will allow those cells to stay rigid within the device and be able to um, differentiate without causing problems. So in summary, islet cell transplantation can be reversed in selected patients with type 1 diabetes. Encapsulation is an effective means to protect the islets, allows retrievable and replacement of the cells if necessary. These devices are stable and of clinical grade quality. Encapsulation also permits the, the opportunity to co-encapsulate with growth factors, cytokines, or even stem cells. And clinical trials have initiated with encapsulated islets and stem cells. We feel a multi-platform or hybrid device that I didn't talk about today can address some of the key issues that still face the field. In terms of acknowledgement, uh, I have several collaborations on campus as well as uh, at the University of Groningen in, in the Netherlands. Uh, research funding comes from a variety of sources including the Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Center, Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, the Padre Foundation and CIRM. Thank you very much for your time. So I'm sure people have questions. There's plenty of time for those. Dr. Lakey and Dr. Wang will stay. Can I just ask you guys as questions come to repeat them so okay. that everybody can hear them? Want to pass that back? Yeah. Oh, come on. Um, you 
several talks. Um, I was wondering if type 1 diabetes has a specific genetic marker associated with it so that we can do a genetic screen and know whether or not the person will, will develop type 1 diabetes. So then we can intervene beforehand. That there are several um, genetic markers have been identified. Okay. The question is whether or not we can identify specific genetic marker from the patients, therefore we can design the right treatment. And the answer is yes. There are uh, genetic markers that have been identified with type 1 diabetes. And there is correlation, but the correlation is not tight. So not necessary. you have the genotype would develop type 1 diabetes. That's one of the difficulty. The second issue is the genetic markers seem to vary from population to population. So more research are needed. Yeah. <laughs> this is for Dr. Lakey regarding the Argentina clinical trial. Was it successful enough that it would move to the next phase, or was there a fundamental flaw? Good question. The the question was in regards to the Argentina in terms of their initial patients. Um, it, was, it was done as a collaboration between Living Cell Technology, which is a New Zealand-based company. Their goal was to perform this clinical trial. Um, they paid for the trial. The results showed some function, not patients being able to become off insulin 100%, but still improvements in their post-transplant outcome. Is it good enough to move forward? So the Argentinian government has supported the development of a center for this. We are initiating a trial in May of 2019 using some of our technologies that developed here. And we've been in contact with the J JDRF in New York and their legal people to ensure that all of the experiments done in Argentina are done in a way that we can bring those results back to the United States and help us get through the FDA. So, yes. The uh, Federal Minister of Health in Argentina is the first person to clone a cow. So he's a very interesting scientist. So I'm going there next, in two weeks, so I'll be meeting him and moving forward on discussions of how to, how to, how to get this trial going faster. Yes. Um, sorry, I have one more. This is for Dr. Lanky. Um, the transplant that you did for the HESD-derived cells into nude mice, yes. um, in those you have artificially um, essentially increased the insulin levels. What if you had transplanted those cells into animals that had an immune system problem similar to what type 1 diabetes? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the first step was to prove the technology. Sorry, the question was related to putting the cells into N these nude mice, these mice that don't have an immune response and obviously won't reject the cells. And the next step is putting them into animal models with fully, Im fully immune competence. So those studies are underway. We're also looking at co-encapsulating some immunorepellents into the capsules to see if we can use that. So there's several studies that are ongoing in our lab, supported by the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation to help us better understand the, the immunity regarding these transplants and Reza at the back is a PhD student that's doing a lot of that work. I'm kind of interested in how successful you've been in the socio-political aspects of getting this up. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm really interested in the socio-political aspects of this and how you've coordinated global, a globalization of the research. Um, you know, because it, it, it brings a lot more um, oh, gr study groups in. No. Um, what problems have you reached there? And second of all, since pigs are where insulin comes, effect, uh, you know, more highly efficate insulin comes from, have you ever thought of doing studies with them? So the first question was uh, in regards to how do we collaborate. Uh, in academia, we work together with groups. Uh, we, we've hosted groups from all over the world. As part of the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, there is a consortium which meets every six months. It started out as six groups, now it's about 18 groups. A lot of the researchers that I collaborate with, we write grants together, we have projects together, and we're all working towards curing diabetes. That's our uh, fundamental goal. Uh, 
The second question was about pigs. So pig insulin and human insulin differ by one amino acid. We have xenogeneic studies ongoing. And in fact, the group in Argentina is using pig islet cells, and we've shared with them our protocols that we developed uh, several years ago to maximize the yield of these pig islets to transplant into, into their patients. How long, Dr. Dr. Wang, does one of those artificial pumps last? How often does a patient have to fill them? Well, they, they last for, uh, they are for a long time, years. And the glucose sensor right now is lasting for 14 days. Every 14 days, you replace the sensor. But the pump would, would last for years and years. Um, with, the, like, with the pumps that you use, um, like, I'm not sure how to describe it. How? Oh, God, God. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. How does the insulin get in there? Yeah. OK. You have to replace the insulin. You have to refill it, okay, when you're about to run out. Uh, it doesn't go through the body. It, you replace the cartridge, or you inject the insulin into the pump. The artificial, the artificial pancreas um, that you showed looks like there's no glycocin availability, but I heard there was going to be. Is there? Or is that coming? Uh, glucagon, yes. I'm sorry, glucagon, that's what I meant. The, the one I show has already has incorporated glucagon in it together as a part of that pump. So it, in a in sense, it's a two pump in one. One glucagon pump and one insulin pump. That's the reason why they got such a good result. And is it available now? Uh, they are making it. <laughs> uh, supposed to be available uh, next year. <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay. We have a lot of students here and various levels, freshmen, sophomore. Do you have suggestions, and this question is for either of you, if they were interested in pursuing a career at this stage in high school, what could they do? What, what would you suggest? Um, read as much as you need to, and then if you need to, uh, somehow get connected with a scientist or with a medical doctor. Uh, so we can ask questions or shadow or get even more knowledge. The more you got exposed to, you would figure out the path and you will be able to navigate through various stages of development. It takes years of training, high school, college, medical school, graduate school, residency training, further research fellowship training. Uh, it don't takes, be yeah, don't be discouraged. <laughs> so, so we bring, Yeah. So we bring in high school students uh, in our lab. We have about 15 to 20 students every summer, and then some of them, they come to university. We have students from other universities participating. Um, some of our graduate students started out as summer students, so we encourage students, and, and, and we want a commitment from them. Uh, and in fact, we have several students that are diabetic that have a vested interest in our program. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, sorry, as a follow-up question to earlier on the bionic uh, artificial pancreas, did they already develop a stable glucagon preparation? Or that you, you, you hit the right point because right now, okay, the, the question is, he's asking whether or not the glucagon preparation right now on the market is ready to be delivered through the pump. The regular glucagon you can buy off the shop or in the pharmacy store cannot, okay, because it got degraded quickly. However, they already developed a new formulation uh, that can allow them to deliver a glucagon through the pump. And from what I know, there are also groups working on this issue. They are developing analogs of glucagon that can stay active uh, for a long time. The glucagon that are in the islet cells are very stable and can secrete long term. Is the uh, glucose sensor surgically implanted? No, it's uh, just uh, attached to the skin with a little uh, micro needle. I have a question on the, the, the sensor and the algorithm uh, part of it. Uh, are, are the reaction of these algorithms fast enough? Have there been cases that from the time the sensor measures till the algorithm reacts and the insulin gets in, the patient could potentially go to seizure or causes some problem? Or they're pretty much yes. fast enough? 
Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, the question is, um, at the time when the glucose is sensing through the sensor, mm -hmm. it sends a message to the pump. And then the pump then calculate and react and then infuse insulin. Mm -hmm. There might be a gap between these two actions and therefore create an opportunity for you to misfire in correct dose of insulin and cause low blood sugar. They have pretty much ironed out that part of the issue because you can anticipate the slope uh, by mathematical means, they were able to calculate it. And from the pump that I have seen so far on the market, uh, it uh, seems to be working uh, quite good. And the next generation of pump that are going to be working out, uh, I can only anticipate, imagine it'll be uh, even better. There are not short of companies, not just small companies, but these are big companies. Right now, there are at least 12 companies uh, throughout the world companies such as Johnson & Johnson and so forth, uh, they are developing artificial pancreas. So you can anticipate a lot of new artificial pancreas will be uh, coming on the market uh, in the next couple of years. I'm just going to ask you a very broad question and ask you to predict. Do you, anticipate, do you anticipate in your lifetimes that diabetes could be cured? OK. Well, this is a, a good question. Uh, can I anticipate I will make $100 million in my life? I don't know. I cannot tell you. But what I can tell you is if you are committed to it, you start to work on it, uh, someday you might be able to do it. And if you decide to sit on it and not doing anything, you will never reach that point. Okay? The same thing as clinical trial. Clinical trials are sometimes um, unreliable, or sometimes can be even dangerous because of the side effect that we did not anticipate, as we evident. Okay, and many of the clinical trials are going to fail, but for sure, you will never have a cure without clinical trial. Dr. Lakey, you, uh, so yeah, no, I think the clinical trials are our testing grounds. Some work, some don't, but we learn from every example. So is it going to happen in my lifetime? I, I predict it will. I think the advancements in stem cell differentiation, we have these cells now. There's a lot of work in academia as well as in, in biotech, working with different devices. I just shared in my 12-minute talk uh, just a couple of them. I could have spent the whole lecture talking about all the different options for the biomaterials. Many of, some of them are in clinical trials right now in, in, in other countries, right? Diabetes is a global epidemic, and so there are trials going on in many centers, and it's moving forward. So uh, 1990s was the decade of the cure predicted by the JDRF. Our Edmonton Protocol, we published that paper in 2000. So we, for the first time, were able to show that cell therapies can work, and we were able to show that. Now we have to optimize that with the cell source and try to eliminate the need for drugs and mechanical interventions. Mechanical interventions have to be tested, they have to be validated, they have to be replaced all the time. So I, I just want to interject, this is like, you know, chair's prerogative, director's prerogative. Um, and I want to pick up on something that, that came out from the two of these guys. Although I'm not a diabetes researcher, right? I'm a, a neuroscientist and a stem cell biologist. Science is all about rinse and repeat. And I think this is really important to get across to the to public as a concept. A clinical trial is not a failure if we learn something from it. And so a lot of times the goal of designing a phase one clinical trial or even a phase one, phase one, two A is all about getting through the first steps of how, where do we go with this? How do we move it into the clinical realm? What, are we asking the right question? and refining those questions and refining our endpoint measures so that we can do a later successful trial. And so it's a human experiment. That's the goal. And so it really is rinse and repeat of what we've done in the lab, moving it on through that pathway, that pipeline of translation. And so lots and lots of things fail in the lab and lots of lots of things fail when we get to clinical trial. What we want to do is construct clinical trials that we can learn something from, right? And be able to move the field forward in the long run. There was a high school student uh, question over here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so Go ahead and stand up. Oh, so we were just wondering, like, as a group, you mentioned that you use human, like, embryonic stem cells. Where do you guys get those stem cells? And you mentioned that there's two types. Like, what's the significance between using 
the human embryonic ones between like the adult ones. Do you want to show it Sure. Well, uh, there are more than one way of doing this. Okay, there are uh, cell lines that are established from human embryos that were supposed to be discarded because we have like in vitro fertilization program, and all those embryos that are perfectly good embryo, but they don't ever got implanted uh, to become a uh, baby. So those embryos are supposed to be destroyed, and then. Uh, the U.S. government allow those embryos to be used to develop human embryonic stem cell, and the U.S. government has approved many of the cell lines, and those cell lines are available to all of us, all the scientists, um, to uh, do study on them. And there are also people, laboratories, using the same strategy to develop human embryonic uh, stem cells that are totally under the guidelines of federal and local government. Okay. Uh, what food should I avoid? Because the school food that I'm provided every day is not healthy. Uh, what food should I avoid? Because the school food isn't that healthy. Well, we, we have to get your principal into this room. Okay. Okay. Uh, school food is not healthy. That's true. I mean, uh, people say the two biggest unhealthy food in the American society is two things, sugar and salt. And I will add the third one, that's high fat, right? Uh, if you uh, try to go for that low sugar, low salt, and low fat, that's probably more healthy and eat plenty of uh, uh, fruits and natural products. Uh, but we have to get your principal into the room, we have to get the governor into the room, we have to get your congressman into the room in order to change that. Any takers? Your research seems to be more emphasized on type 1 or more type 2. Yes, my research focuses on type 1 diabetes for the most part. We have some projects that I didn't present today that are addressing some of the issues in type 2, but it's mostly type 1 diabetes. Uh, where, what I start, when I started in Canada, there was a high incidence of type 1 diabetes in our region, so there was funding, there was opportunities to work with people, so the type 1 diabetes, although it only represents about 10% of the total population of people with diabetes, it's the sickest of the population. They're the sickest of the patients. They're the ones that would benefit most from an islet cell transplantation. Is the incidence of type 2 diabetes accelerating much like, you know, year over year? Yeah, it's accelerating, increasing as I show. There will be another 200 million uh, type diabetes, mostly type 2, uh, for the next uh, 20 years uh, worldwide. But at the same time, type 1 diabetes incidence is also rising. We don't know why. We don't know why. There must be some kind of environmental factor, and uh, the researchers have been working hard trying to identify that factor, but there was no uniform uh, factor that has been identified so far. And what do you think the government needs to do, given that, and or do you believe that they're doing enough in terms of, like, the student said back there that he doesn't like the high school food or school food? What other things do you think need to happen? Well, that, that, that's politics. That's not medicine or science. Uh, although we cannot avoid that part. Okay. But what do you think needs to happen in terms of, what would you like to see happen? Let me ask you that question. Well, you're asking a very deep question, what the government should do and in order to improve these problems. Everything compete for dollars, and we only have a fixed amount of money, of funding available in the U.S. or, or worldwide. So if you take money away from cancer f to fund research, uh, to fund diabetes, that might be one way. Uh, or you can create it with, try to think how, how important it is for diabetes research, the impact on health care and the future health of the population. That would be one way of doing it. Okay? But it would have to involve a lot of coordination and effort, uh, including in the Capitol Hills. I'm a trained diabetic for several years, and I've always been told to eat healthy and stuff like that. Of course, the recent uh, trends with uh, organic foods and stuff like that, 
I never really knew whether that really paid off organically. I just recently heard a study about how people who eat organic foods are less likely to get cancers like that. Have they shown any uh, correlation with organics opposed to the, how blood sugars are controlled and stuff like that? Uh, that is not an easy question to answer whether or not organic food is better for diabetes. I mean, I would like to believe so. Uh, if, if organic food is growing the right way, has less chemicals and pesticides and so forth, it's probably better for the general health if it's truly organic food. Uh, but uh, I don't have a firm um, uh, scientific evidence for it yet. Maybe we should do a project on that one. Okay, so um, what are the main causes of diabetes? Okay, uh, ty <laughs> type 1 diabetes, we still don't know what's causing it. Okay, it's an immune system, but there is a factor that we haven't identified. For type 2, uh, there are several important factors. For example, if your parents has diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you are at higher risk. Okay. If you are at, uh, you, uh, if you are, if you live in a sedentary lifestyle, doesn't move around, doesn't exercise, and eat unhealthy food, uh, you are going to be at the risk. If you are overweight, you are going to be at the risk. Uh, if you are drinking more soda, uh, to a certain extent, you are going to have, uh, I mean, not the diet soda. I'm, I'm talking about the regular Coke and so forth. You are going to be at uh, higher risk. 